the way I, I like to be. Surrounded by my, my books, my, my pictures, and my friends. Even you, who didn't know, but were my friends. Your forefathers learned to realize the most profound and uh, dramatic revolution in this continent, the fight for freedom of the 13 colonies. So, paradoxically, fighting against American imperialism, we are nothing but uh, the, the followers, the humble followers of your forefathers. You have continued saying that after the Second World War, you are the freest country in the world, and you are the allies of South Africa, of fascist Spain, of all the worst regimes that have ever been, Batista in Cuba, Samosa in Nicaragua, all military dictatorships, Pinochet. It's not the Marxist-Leninist ideology that prevents us from having relations uh, of a normal sort uh, in, in with Cuba, if normal is understood by simply exchanging uh, representatives at the ambassadorial level. We, we conceivably could do that with a Marxist-Leninist Cuba that uh, minded its own business. I'm a true believer in this, in the, uh, the democratic uh, bounds, you know, okay, Castro is in this film, so what? He can say whatever he wants. History, from my point of view, has proven him wrong up to now. Every Cuban, in order to understand really our history, they must come sometime in, the, in their life, they must be here, they must come here. It's a very important and touching place for us, really. You are seeing that, they never, that this has been very difficult to get to La Plata. And the roads are so bad. And the roads are very, very bad. The climb to La Plata takes the better part of a day. A dirt path winds through the jungle to Castro's guerrilla headquarters of three decades ago. Few foreigners are granted permission to visit La Plata. Our crew was the first to be allowed to film there. We were escorted by veterans of Castro's rebel army for whom La Plata is a revolutionary shrine. Following them, we began a journey into Cuba's past that we hoped would illuminate its controversial present. For it was here in these mountains that the guerrillas fought for visions of a new Cuba, culminating a century of struggle. And it was here that we hoped to discover the original goals of the revolution. But the roots of the revolution go still further back in time. Sugar, the blessing and the curse of Cuba, has dominated its economy and society since the late 18th century, when the first sugar boom transformed Cuban landowners into a sugar aristocracy with a lifestyle of luxury that rivaled Spain's. Cuba became a wealthy island for the few. For the black slaves who actually harvested the sugar cane, there was poverty and oppression. It was these slaves, together with other Cuban patriots, who rebelled in 1868 against Spanish rule, a struggle at once for the abolition of slavery and the emancipation of the island. After 10 years, that war ended in Cuban defeat. But Jose Martí, poet and revolutionary, whose words would become the lyrics of the song Guantanamera, began a new struggle. With the poor people of the earth, the song says, I want to cast my lot. Exiled in the United States, Marti organized a revolt that would cost him his life in 1895. His words and example have inspired Cuban revolutionaries ever since. I was greatly attracted to the thoughts of Marti as a thinker, a patriot, and a revolutionary of great ethics. And then I combined the two. Marxism and the ideas of Marti, ideas of Cuba and ideas of the world. I am a revolutionary. I am pro the Cuban revolution. 
but not, I'm not pro-Castro's revolution, which is a communist revolution, which is different completely from the revolution that Jose Marti thought of, and many others fight and died for. Jose Marti would have died in a Cuba ruled by Castro. Well, if Jose Marti would be alive today, he would be Fidel Castro, of course. We have to demand the knowledge of our history in order to accept any judgment about our history. But that history is controversial. To quote Teddy Roosevelt, the Spanish-American War wasn't much of a war, but the best one we could find. For the US, it was a step toward becoming a world power. For the Cubans, it was a struggle for independence that Americans first supported and then betrayed. In 1901, the Platt Amendment was imposed on Cuba's constitution, giving the United States the right to intervene in its internal affairs. The future of Cuba was now in American hands. It's quite possible that uh, some historical uh, resentments uh, have lingered in Cuba. Certainly, uh, some Cubans more than others feel those resentments, and indeed, there has been uh, a calculated effort in the last 25 years to uh, recreate the past and to uh, blame uh, the United States uh, uh, falsely for uh, many of the problems which uh, Cuba had historically. One of the problems was Cuba's over-reliance on sugar, the bittersweet crop that brought the island first boom and then bust. With the United States government guaranteeing stability, nearly one and a quarter billion dollars in American investment poured into the island by 1924, transforming Cuba into the world's leading sugar producer, but one that was dependent on U.S. capital, goods, and markets. Uh, the United States and Cuba had a, a pretty close relationship uh, uh, for many years, uh, and some of those years were years of democratic governments in Cuba. Uh, we had uh, uh, welcomed the fact that Cuba grew to be uh, one of the richest countries in the hemisphere with very high educational and health standards long before the, uh, the communists came to power. After all, we played baseball together. Americans were here to stay. Guantanamo became a U.S. naval base and the Isle of Pines virtually an American colony. My aunt and uncle, twin babies, 18 months old, Mother and Dad and I, we came in 1920 to the Alpines. I was 16 years old, soon 17. Were there many wealthy Americans down here at that time? Yes, we were a big colony here. There must have been at least 1,500 Americans. Many Cubans felt that their whole island had become an American possession, despite President Coolidge's return of the Isle of Pines to Cuban President Machado in 1925. Machado became identified with the sacrifice of Cuban needs to American interests. As the giant sugar mills took over the Cuban countryside, the number of landless and unemployed grew, along with popular discontent and the communist-led labor unions. Machado's response was to send opponents to the Presidio, the new prison he had built on the Isle of Pines. Its brutality came to symbolize his rule. The Great Depression brought sugar prices to an all-time low and unrest to a head. An angry population demanded an end to dictatorship and corruption and a fair share of the wealth. Machado left the country in August of 1933, and the student-led rebellion put a reform government into power. Its motto was, Cuba for the Cubans. Their new leader, Ramon Grau, only ruled for four months. The U.S. ambassador thought him too nationalistic and too weak to meet the growing threat of communist revolution in the countryside. The ambitious young army chief, Fulgencio Batista, who had helped put Grau in power, now ousted him, bringing dreams of reform to an end. If the United States had something to be blamed for in our whole history, I can tell you, yes, they do. Because they have been involved in politics and in more or less manipulating governments one way or the other. I myself can't forget the image of the American soldier that uh, went to the top of Marti's statue. Uh, 
I won't repeat what he did, but you can imagine. He made peace, no? In the statue of José Martí. Well, José Martí is for us a sacred human being. Humiliation bred cynicism. In 1944, Batista stepped down and Grau was elected president, but he was no longer the reformer of 33. Corruption reached high into his government and even the police battled for a share of the rackets. And Havana was the most corrupted city I have seen in my life. Havana was one of the most important capitals of the Mafia. And these hotels were made for gambling, for prostitution. I do think this is one of the most important sources of the Cuban Revolution, the outrage of the people who didn't want the humiliation of being the bordello of America. Another source was the failure of the democratic process as Batista, with the army's support, seized power in 1952. The United States did not protest, but a new generation of Cubans did. Among their leaders was a young lawyer, Fidel Castro. I always had a certain rebellious spirit. It's uh, one of my characteristics. The Jesuits did not teach me revolutionary ideas, although more than once the Jesuits have been revolutionaries, in many places, a little rebellious. I think that the Jesuits helped me a lot with their discipline to value certain ethics, a certain notion of justice. Castro was among those who attacked the economic and social injustice in Batista's Cuba. When the dictator suspended new elections, Castro took up arms. On July 26, 1953, he led 126 young revolutionaries in a bold assault on the Moncada army barracks. The attack failed, Castro was arrested, and 80 of his followers killed, many after they surrendered. At his trial, Castro spoke for hours in his own defense. Quoting Marti and Thomas Jefferson, he indicted the Batista dictatorship, saying, you may convict me, it does not matter. History will absolve me. Well, actually, I could say a few unpleasant things about prison, but also I could say a few good things, because we took advantage of the time available. We read a lot. We studied a lot. 14, 15 hours, the whole day, reading, everything, a lot of novels, also economics. We studied a lot of Marxism there. Actually, the censor allowed us to receive Das Kapital. Then there was a book, I remember that someone sent it, The Technique of the Coup d'Etat. Someone thought that in our trade, we needed to know the technique of the Coup d'Etat. Nonetheless, they did not allow us to receive that book. I had heard about the book. I had read it even before the Moncada. And it was pure fantasy. Cusio Malapartes was a man of great imagination. There's no technique for a coup d'etat. Released from prison, Castro went to Mexico and organized an invasion of Cuba with 82 followers in 1956. Surprised by Batista's forces, the few survivors made their way to the Sierra Maestra Mountains where they set up their headquarters. We had reached La Plata, a living monument to the revolution. High in these remote mountain jungles, Castro and his rebels improvised a new guerrilla warfare learned not from books, but experience. So I came to the conviction and maybe the fact that I was born in the countryside, near the mountains, helped me. I was able to perceive the fact that a regular army with their tanks, cannons, garrisons, general headquarters, general staff, nevertheless could be neutralized, could be fought if they were taken away from their theories of classical war, and if they were forced to go into the field of irregular warfare and use the topography of the terrain in that war. We were always on the peaks of the hills. Why? Because those are the most strategic places. We moved daily. 
We used to move along constantly. We prepared traps. At times they escaped the traps, at times they didn't. There were, therefore, numerous offenses that took place on the part of the enemy. Batista's forces could never find this place because it was protected by the rebel army and the peasants. So, since the houses and the hospital were camouflaged, the airplanes would fly but couldn't see anything below. Here in the past, there were no schools, hospitals or roads. There was none of that. But when Fidel got here, he started to involve himself and understand the needs of the peasants of this region. It was at La Plata that the guerrillas first confronted the problems of rural Cuba. Here they experimented with new programs for education, nutrition, health care and land reform. Some people were questioning, why are you going to give the women that type of rifle and I have to use this old rifle? Some of the men were, were protesting, so I said, look, I'll explain why. Because they are better soldiers than you are, because they are more courageous than you are. Castro, uh, while in the hills, uh, did not talk about uh, a communist revolution or uh, any sort of a far-reaching revolution of the type that took place. He talked about democracy and freedom. Castro recognized the power of the media. The radio became his medium of choice with help from Argentine revolutionary Ernesto Che Guevara. El che, che was able to get hold of a radio station. This becomes a very important point because the station immediately achieved ratings. There were many radio listeners. It had only one kilowatt, but it could be heard throughout the province of Oriente, even in Havana, in Caracas, in Central America, because it was at the height of this mountain. So the station became an important element in our struggle. All across Cuba, Castro's movement and other rebel groups were locked in an underground struggle against Batista. The urban resistance bore the brunt of Batista's response with nearly 20,000 losing their lives. When the urban movement's general strike failed in April 1958, Castro's rural guerrillas became the rebellion's main hope. But reports of Batista's atrocities began to erode his American backing. The United States stopped arms shipments and began considering political alternatives. Fearful of losing U.S. support, Batista threw his army into a final offensive against La Plata. But the Castro forces counterattacked and Batista's demoralized troops retreated. In September 1958, rebel columns streamed out of the mountains and headed for Havana. At Santa Clara, Che Guevara won a decisive victory. As Guevara approached Havana, Batista fled the country. It seemed as if Jose Marti's dream of a free Cuba was about to be realized at last. Among those who had fought against Batista and celebrated his overthrow, there were differing visions of the new Cuba they should create. Fidel Castro had promised democracy and land reform. The moderates in his movement expected only mild social change. But the more radical guerrillas wanted to revolutionize Cuba from the bottom up. Well, it does bring back memories. Uh, I was in Havana January the 1st of 1959 when the Batista government fell. And there, the day that uh, Castro marched in, Havana was seized uh, with elation and visions of a golden future. He could have gone straight into Havana. And what we saw was that extraordinary sense of how he involved a lot of people. Right. He took eight days on, it turned it into a procession. It was a triumphal by, procession. And by the time he arrived there, he had in fact augmented his soldiers by a factor of about 100. Uh, so right from the beginning, uh, we're dealing with an unusual political actor. But I think um, that it's uh, important to distinguish between revolution and Castro. My point is that Castro was the chief of the revolution at the very beginning, in 1959, as a product of a compromise of uh, a, a lot of political forces. 
It's a mistake to identify Castro and Cuban Revolution as the same thing. In 1959, of course, he was our last hope of change. But the majority of Cubans did seem to identify the revolution with this man and expected him to fulfill their dreams of a better life. Pressure from rural and urban workers impelled Castro to radicalize the revolution over the objections of the middle class. Slot machines, symbols of Cuba's corrupt past, were destroyed. In May of 59, Castro returned to La Plata to proclaim the land reform he had promised his peasant supporters. He ordered the bars of the infamous Presidio knocked out. All across Cuba, political prisoners were freed. Hundreds of Batista police and military officers were tried and executed for alleged war crimes in public proceedings that shocked many Americans. Moderates in Castro's own movement began to question the direction the revolution was taking. One of the main persons in that period was Major Hubert Matos, who's now in exile, and many people criticize him because he wants to go on with things that were done by the revolution, but not with Castro and not with communism. That's a great difference. He dared to doubt, and that's the greatest sin in Castro's Cuba. Matos was the most prominent of the thousands of political prisoners jailed during the struggle for power in which the Communist Party emerged as Castro's ally. Over half a million Cubans fled the island. Then they all left at the time of the revolution, but they, they thought the revolution was only going to be a temporary thing, and many of them left caretakers to uh, take care of their homes, thinking they would come back but uh, they never came back. In 1960, a series of provocative actions on both sides left Cuban-American relations devastated. The U.S. drastically cut back Cuba's sugar quota while Havana nationalized $1 billion of American-owned enterprises. The irrationality of the system, which was, is, and will continue to be irrational, capitalism, with respect to feudal society, was progressive until it became, in the view of the Marxists, an outdated system, which had to be replaced by a better one. Well, they took our business. We had a dry dock business, and that was taken by the government. But we were paid for it. We weren't paid what it was worth, but we were paid for it. And that's what I'm living on. Well, it was a jolt. It was uh, something that took me a little time to understand and to accept. The U.S. response to this unprecedented challenge was predictably hostile. The American naval base at Guantanamo became a focus for mounting tensions. Washington imposed economic sanctions and issued diplomatic warnings. An exile army trained by the CIA began a covert war from Florida bases confrontation seemed inevitable. I think there did come a point uh, in 1960 when the Cubans may have had second thoughts and they gave us a note saying they were ready to discuss all issues in disagreement. The United States was convinced that Cuba had made its choice and it rejected the note. Uh, it rejected the possibility of negotiations. Perhaps nothing would have come of it. Perhaps, as I say, the uh, all the elements were simply too strong, uh, carrying us toward a confrontation. In retrospect, however, I wish we had given it a try. Why doesn't he go to the uh, Swiss embassy in Havana, for example, looking at approach? And, well, when he does, but will, he, uh, he's most your, interested in selling his image to America and going to the journalists and going to the cameras, because he still well, keeps that vision of selling his image to the world. He, if he wants to normalize relations with another country, why doesn't he go straight to that embassy or and talk well, to I'm the... I'm trying to tell you that he does. Uh, I was the chief of the U.S. interest section in Havana for three years, and the Cubans did make all sorts of overtures directly to the interest section through diplomatic channels. And those overtures were uh, consistently 
ignored by the United States government. President Eisenhower had rejected Castro's request for a meeting in 1959. By September 1960, when Castro addressed the United Nations, it was too late for negotiating. Unwelcome at a Midtown hotel, the Cuban leader moved to Harlem's Hotel Teresa, where he met Khrushchev for the first time. Four months later, the U.S. broke off diplomatic relations, and newly elected President Kennedy approved the CIA's plans for an exile invasion. Former President Nixon recognized that as early as uh, March 1960, uh, uh, the U.S. government ordered the CIA to begin preparation for the Bay of Pigs invasion. At that time, there was no um, Soviet ambassador in Havana, neither Cuban ambassador in Moscow. We didn't have diplomatic relations, we didn't have trade with the Soviets at that very moment. Confrontation finally came in April 1961 at the Bay of Pigs. The invasion plan had two flaws. First, landing in a swampy area without adequate air cover, and second, assuming the exile landing would automatically trigger a nationwide revolt against Castro. When it was over, hundreds of exiles had been taken prisoner. Castro had won a decisive victory, and the U.S. had suffered an embarrassing hemispheric defeat. All citizens who are in agreement raise their hands. Castro seized the occasion to declare the revolution socialist. David was victorious over Goliath. The Cuban people united behind Castro as never before. If Fidel is communist, then so are we, was the chant. Still fearful of U.S. invasion, Castro turned to the Soviet Union for military assistance. The specter of Russian nuclear missiles sites 90 miles from Miami brought the world to the brink of nuclear war in October 1962. Shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States. Cuba had become a pawn in a superpower confrontation it could not control. Castro mobilized his troops, but all they could do was wait in the bunkers for the expected U.S. attack. At the 11th hour, Kennedy and Khrushchev arrived at a compromise. Soviet missiles would be removed from Cuba forever, and the United States would promise never to invade the island. Castro was angry at Khrushchev for agreeing to withdraw the missiles without consulting him. But with the United States pressing for an international embargo against Cuba and the Cuban economy already in trouble, Castro swallowed his anger, went to Moscow in 1963 to secure economic aid, and was given a hero's welcome. Viva la amistad entre los pueblos soviéticos y el pueblo cubano. Was either Cuba or the United States completely to blame, as declarations from either side would have us believe? Or was the legacy of history, the conflict of interests, the clash of visions too strong to permit any other outcome? One thing was certain, America's image of Cuba and Cuban-American relations would be frozen in time for decades to come. I don't see how we can be absolutely independent of a superpower so huge as the United States being so close. What is really pathetic is that Cuba had to go all the way across the world to get entangled with Russia, which uh, from the point of tradition and culture and whatever has nothing to do with our most cherished traditions. If you don't know Marxism, I can tell you the truth, you know nothing. It is like an individual in the forest without a compass, in the sea without a polar star, without a sun, without someone guiding you. Until I discovered the Marxist documents, I knew nothing about politics. To me, it was like a light. The 60s were a decade of radicalism across the globe. For many leftists around the world, Cuba led the way.
Fidel Castro remained the revolution's unquestioned leader, but Che Guevara was its driving ideological force. No importa que cada día el imperialismo esté más agresivo. Los pueblos que han decidido luchar por su libertad y mantener la libertad alcanzada no se pueden dejar intimidar por eso. Y juntos construiremos la nueva vida. Guevara not only symbolized the new socialist man in Cuba's drive to create a communist utopia, but also the heroic guerrilla as Cuba promoted its revolutionary model abroad. In 1966, Guevara returned to South America. One year later, his defeat and death in Bolivia signaled the failure of Cuba's claim to be the center of third world revolution. It marked the end of an era and the beginning of a myth. I remember that evening, it was a demonstration, I think one of the biggest in the revolution square. Cubans were very noisy people, we, we talk a lot. And that evening, it was, I heard the greatest silence I ever heard in my life. The death of Che was a defeat. His death was not the only defeat Cuba would experience by the end of the 60s. Castro promised an unprecedented 10 million ton sugar harvest by 1970 and mobilized the entire nation. Its costly failure prompted a reassessment of their revolution. I think that our revolution has simply developed in ideas, in experience. It has also made mistakes, and I have said this, errors of idealism. We wanted to advance too fast. We wanted to reach the communist stage of society without going through the socialist stage. In the 1970s, the curtain rose on a new act. Castro was now less inclined to improvise, more willing to follow the orthodox Soviet model, even willing to yield a portion of his political power to the Communist Party bureaucracy. El partido lo resume todo. The party encompasses all. In it, the dreams of all the revolutionaries over our long history are synthesized. In it, our individualism disappears, and we learn to think as one. Cuba's economy also changed significantly after 1970 with Soviet aid and advice. Sugar was still the mainstay, but production goals were more realistic and new industries developed. Cuba found a comfortable niche in the Soviet bloc's common market, but it was a different destiny from the original La Plata dream of economic independence. To many, it seemed as if Cuba had merely exchanged a dependence on the United States for a dependence on the Soviet Union. The amount of assistance that Cuba receives from the Soviet Union, doesn't that represent a dependence, a very strong dependence? Yes, what aid? Economic? Sugar, oil, technicians. You think that's a gift we receive? That's the theory that we receive six million a day or something like that. That is the problem. You're looking at the world upside down. If the Soviets pay for our sugar at a higher price, excellent. If that is subsidy, well, we love it. You call it subsidy, we call it fair action and fair trade relations. Soviet assistance and trade have helped Castro offer material rewards to a nation weary of sacrifice. Since 1970, the share of an average family's income spent on non-rationed goods, like these Russian appliances, has risen from only 3% to 75%. Still, complaints about variety, style, and quality of available goods abound. Cuba is far from a consumer paradise. Comparisons across economic systems are difficult and debatable, but the United Nations ranks Cuba's standard of living with that of Costa Rica, the highest in Central America, and Cuba's distribution of income one of the most equitable in the hemisphere. 
The new peasant cooperatives and free markets where peasants can sell surplus produce at unregulated prices have helped compensate for inefficiencies of state enterprises and central planning. One day, this group of farmers decided to start and uh, unite our lands and create a cooperative. One the cooperative was in existence, the state would guarantee us all the necessary machinery to work the land. Well, you're seeing them at this moment thanks to the revolution and to the union of the land and the cooperatives nowadays. A large part of us could not afford a TV, a radio, a washing machine, an electric iron. Nowadays, we have all the necessary conditions. We have everything guaranteed by the state, from the food to, well, even here, you can see a motorcycle that was won by a member of the cooperative. They're saying, if you're really poor, by and large, uh, you'll be employed. If you're really poor, by and large, your children will go to school. If you're really poor, your children have access to public health. And I think in Cuba, that's what they do best. Okay, let's say that Castro has given the poor people in Cuba housing, schooling, uh, medical assistance. What do they have to pay for that? Ask any poor person in the world if they are willing to exchange housing, medical attention, schooling for their personal freedom, their personal decisions, their personal capacity of making mistakes without sorrows. I think only slaves that like being slaves are willing to to do that kind of trade. Above all, it is the masses that should be given attention, that should command, and we shouldn't concern ourselves with the privileges nor the benefits of one person, as is done in other countries. At Havana Psychiatric Hospital, where Dr. Ordaz gave us a guided tour, schizophrenics are treated through work therapy. We follow Marxist philosophy, because this is a socialist country that is building communism. Now, if we were to make a survey, we'd find a great number of psychiatrists who have moved away from Freudian tendencies because it is seen as something more artificial, less realistic, uh, something that lacks a philosophy like the one we have in our society. We found a similar philosophy prevailed at the Havana women's prison. We make the uh, inmates here forget about all the problems they have left behind so their minds concentrate in the work they are doing. And this also helps us to have a good discipline here. This prison, as any other one in Cuba, are visited by foreign people. We have nothing to hide. Where else in the world can you film a prison like you are doing here? What do you feel about what's happened to Cuba since the revolution? What do I feel about it? Well, I have no feelings. I'm absolutely neutral. I'm neutral. I don't want to make any comment. May I say something? Listen, I don't think you can be neutral in this regard. I want you to really say something about this because you can't be neutral after you've lived this time and you've seen everything around. So why but should you remain neutral? I know you otherwise, I mean, listen, no, but when you've been taken around and that, and you see all the changes, so many schools, so many highways, so many programs, you've been taken mm -hmm. around by the government, mm -hmm. and you've been shown the different places, mm -hmm. and you have said that if the Americans that lived here once Could come back, it. they would fall on their backs. They would be astounded. Brother, they would see. be astounded to uh -huh. see the 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 progress and what has happened to the island. It's tremendous, tremendous. The schools, the hospitals, the factories, the roads, well, everything, the apartment houses, the private homes, the many little towns, towns I have that I don't even know anymore. I don't know them.
Travel to the confines of our island, not to the capital, but to the confines of our island, and you will see that it is a lie. The lie that in our country there is no freedom to act or freedom of speech. Everyone expresses what he wants, says what he feels, and does as he pleases. Now, within a framework, framed within pure socialist laws, one cannot indulge in vice, one cannot be a thief, one cannot be openly homosexual, one cannot commit the many atrocities seen every day in capitalist societies, which you don't find in our country. Yeah, there's repression here, but not the repression of an army or the police, but rather the repression of the people themselves at the level of popular-based committees, the CDRs, which do not allow in their block smoking marijuana, selling marijuana openly, stealing or molesting a girl. None of that happens in our country. And if that's what you call repression, then that's what repression is there for. The CDRs, the Committees for the Defense of the Revolution, are bloc associations originally established to defend against the anti-Castro covert war of the early 60s. Today they do everything from cleaning the street and vaccinating the children to teaching political education and guarding against crime. To some they are good Samaritans, to others the watchdogs of conformity. It's a crime that only exists in uh, communist countries. It's called ideological deviationism. I was working at a hospital in Havana, and there was a pile of rubble in the backyard. And uh, there was a meeting to uh, ask voluntary workers to plant coffee plants in the, uh, that pile of rubble. I was the only one that said, uh, there's nothing, nothing is going to grow on a pile of rubble. And the answer, publicly, in front of all the staff, was, if the party says that the plants will grow, they'll grow. But in Cuba, you have to be either on one side of the fence or on the other side of the fence. You cannot be on the fence. Um, we live in, in, in difficult conditions in Cuba. We are blockaded, we are menaced, and therefore we, we have the reactions of a blockaded and menaced country. In the provincial town of Bayamo, we visited the library to get a sense of what books from abroad were available to the average Cuban. Like American writers, can you get American writers here? The librarians were unaware they were being filmed. Like Hemingway, Ray Bradbury. Do they have books like by, by Carlos Fuentes and Borges? By Carlos Fuentes? Borges? Borges? No. Carlos Fuentes? Caprovino? Carlos Fuentes? Borges is uh, from Argentina, is against our revolution. As far as I know, Borges uh, Fuentes is not against our revolution. Cabaret Infante is a Cuban, is a, uh, is violently counter-revolutionary. I don't think he, he wants to be published in Cuba because he hates Cuban revolution. Cabrera Infante, nevertheless, in spite of being a violent, visceral enemy of the revolution, is a writer. Perhaps one day he'll be published in Cuba. As a matter of fact, one day he'll die. And he won't belong anymore to history. He will belong to literature. And at that moment, anything may happen. I think I am committed with my writing, as I am committed with my country. And the contents of my own creativity never would be harmful mm -hmm. for revolution, or will never be against revolution, because it's, it, it's, it would be against my own nature, my own self-being. Mm -hmm. In 1961, uh, Fidel Castro had a meeting with all intellectuals and artists and there he said uh, almost textually, you know, <coughs> with the revolution, everything. I mean, it's within. 
uh, within the revolution, within everything. The but against revolution, nothing. I think that's clear. Yet there are artists and writers who are Cuban who arrive in the United States, and they, they say that something changed in definition of what was within the revolution, what was without, and they were suddenly outside and against the revolution. Yes, I, I know that has uh, been told. And I can responsibly tell you that that's a lie. The best of the Cuban artists are here with the revolution. The free world writers do not have any idea of what it is to uh, be able to lose your job, your, even your freedom, physical freedom, for just a phrase, for just something that you say that might not please the government. The press, I find, is just about the worst press in any country in Latin America, probably only rivaled by possibly Haiti or Paraguay. And that does something to people's spirit. Those people in Cuba who say that there is freedom for everything, why don't they consult these names? Why didn't they see René Arisa, who was eight years in prison? Why didn't they consult and see uh, José Mario? No, a counter-revolutionary cannot write in our paper. Against our system, they cannot write. But that is exactly the same thing that happens in the United States, with the difference that we are honest and we say it, and you say you are the best model of freedom that ever existed. When I see a communist writing in the New York Times or the Washington Post and speaking through CBS, I can assure you that I will open the doors for all counter-revolutionaries to write in our newspapers. But I want you to set the example first. Neither your country, nor my country, nor any country in this tiny planet has the whole truth. Cubans admire and love the United States. Deep within them, they do, even if they say they don't. I hate you, but I love you. Not all who left Cuba in 1980 were the same thing. Some of them were evident delinquents. And many, many, many want to come to Cuba because they have discovered a very evident thing, that paradise is not in the United States. 127,000 Cubans in a few months fleeing Cuba during the Mario uh, Key West boat lift is proof enough that Castro is not infallible and uh, one million Cubans in the United States are proof enough that Castro's Cuba is not a paradise. I carry my homeland in my chest like a grandiose wound. And that's the way I feel. That's the way that thousands and thousands of Cubans feel in exile. Those who don't have revolutionary genes, who don't have revolutionary blood, who don't have the intellect to adapt to the ideas of a revolution, who don't have the heart to adapt to the power and heroism of a revolution, we don't want them. We don't need them. For us, 1980 is not the year of those who left Cuba by Mariel, but the year in which a generation was born in 1959 and later decided to remain in Cuba freely. The new Cubans are much more revolutionaries than we were. The new generations speak revolution without accent. A new generation of Cuban teachers educate 20,000 students from Africa and Latin America each year at special schools on the Isle of Pines. Obviously, it's not uh, the doctors and teachers that one worries about. It is the uh, revolutionary philosophy. When they teach somebody to read, and uh, what he reads is about the imperialist U.S. and, uh, and hatred of the United States, uh, then we don't welcome that. 
si se sienten amenazados if they feel threatened by the examples the altruism the spirit of sacrifice of the cuban teacher and the cuban doctor maybe they're right porque por lo menos nuestros maestros our doctors our engineers our construction workers are expressing a morality that is superior if they want to fear the ideas then i would say yes you are right fear the ideas Thousands of Cubans serve in a socialist peace corps in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. In Africa, Castro has been a particularly active president. Cuban military advisors have trained several African armies, and thousands of Cuban troops have defended Havana's friends in Angola and Ethiopia. As far as the United States government is concerned, Cuba is exporting revolution. We do not export revolution, neither we believe that revolution could be exported. Again, going to the facts, you have uh, the present situation in Central America, for example, where an important revolutionary movement is going on. But you can find very easily the roots of those movements in their own history. Nicaragua's Sandinista revolution may have evolved from its own history, but the United States government fears a domino effect that could ultimately threaten its borders and is concerned about Sandinista and Cuban support for revolutionary movements elsewhere in the region. To say that a nation of the third world, which does not produce any planes, not even planes for crop dusting, could be a threat to the United States, a country with tons of nuclear submarines, a country with sophisticated planes, with technology, electronics, lasers, and Star Wars, that's absolutely ridiculous. It is so ridiculous that if a North American tells me that seriously, I would simply have to laugh, because it is something which cannot be sustained. And speaks badly about the citizen who can be confused. That is brainwashing. You have to completely brainwash an individual so completely so as to not leave him with anything in order to make him believe that Cuba or Nicaragua could be a threat to a country as powerful as the United States. Obviously, if there is no change in the basic thrust of Cuban foreign policy, of uh, promotion uh, of violent revolution in third countries and in close coordination with, uh, with the Soviet Union, there will be no fundamental change in, in the U.S.-Cuban relationship. Can you uh, uh, explain what that hole is over there? This is a shelter. Uh, for what? In case the government of the Imperial of the United States should attack us, we can seek refuge there. Do you think an attack will take place? All sorts of talks are going on so that this won't happen. But we must be prepared just in case. We are going to defend our revolution block by block, house by house. We are decided to give our life, every one of us, everyone in Cuba, you can say that, everyone in Cuba, we are decided to give our life defending our revolution. We have many sacred things to defend. The work we have done, our future, a life that is superior to that of other peoples in this hemisphere, who today are living a life similar to our past. 
Who could ever force us to return to our past? I don't know which are really the concepts of freedom you have in the United States. I think they are very different. That is, yours and ours. Today, the revolutionary vision of La Plata remains only partially fulfilled. The young rebels have settled for less than their original dream. Cubans have gained an economic security and social equality rare in Latin America. But they have not won the political democracy and personal liberty that Fidel Castro also promised. The challenge for all of Latin America is to develop a model of society that can offer both economic security and political freedom. Cuba's destiny is linked to ours by geography, history and family ties. But a generation of confrontation has produced little more than mutual hostility. If the future is to be different, it is vital that both sides begin to see beyond the easy stereotypes of the past.